Well, stocks came out the gate with some vigor today, continuing uh, because of continued signs of consumer strength. Uh, and this in department stores, right? They rocked today. Dillard's, which had been written off by analysts for more than a decade. Macy's also posted strong earnings, expanding its profit margins and offering guidance above consensus. Then after the a close, Etsy enjoying a monster surge here. Now, earnings in Square and Bookings, which is formerly Priceline, sort of mixed and decisive move with those stocks for right now. As for the broad market, uh, I view today like sort of the trading that happens after FOMC meetings wrap up. It's mostly a guessing game. Uh, the true thought analysis of what the, uh, uh, the Fed is saying, we'll get more of that tomorrow. And I guess maybe because Jerome J. Powell is a new kid on the block, it seemed like he took more abuse than normal. More than any Fed chair I can remember since the, the days of epic clashes between Alan Greenspan and Maxine Waters. There were questions about things outside the purview of the Fed, including food assistance programs and DACA legislation. But even with all of that pushing and pulling of Powell to endorse or condemn certain legislation, there were some answers that give us glimmers into the real solutions for real problems. Representative Gwen Moore, for instance, of Wisconsin tried to tie the distribution of post-tax cut corporate windfalls to income inequality. So after acknowledging stagnation of middle class, median income, Powell did point out the essential checklist for what needs to keep America out in front, educational attainment and skill, skills attainment. The conclusion is we need a highly educated workforce. Pretty simple. And then there's the answer to the question designated to dismiss recent economic success and stoke class envy from the representative from Nevada suggesting that higher minimum wages could correct the issue of the rich getting richer at the expense of the middle class. Powell replied. Over long periods of time, the only su sustainable way for wages to go up is for productivity to increase. Productivity, of course, is a function of investments in people's skills and investment in plants and equipment. So I think those are great answers. But now here's a question. Productivity has been stuck. How do we turn that around? From 2007 to 2017, it averaged just 1.2 percent, a very sorry, sorry tally and certainly less significant than a 2.2 percent from 1990 to 2000 and 2.6 percent from 2000 to 2007. So for more on Jay Powell's testimony and the fate of monetary policy in our economy, let's ask two of the best, Jeffrey Cleveland, the chief economist at Peyton and Regal, and John Hilseth. He's a chief eco economics correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. First, the productivity miracle. Uh, Alan Greenspan used to talk about it all the time. Right. What happened to it? Uh, well, it, it seemed to end when the technology bubble burst at the end of the 2000s. The bi I mean, the big question is we have all this technology right now. But it isn't showing up in productivity statistics. There's a different reasons for this. One is you might argue that all this technology is going into our leisure and not into our work. Think about your kids sitting on the couch playing with their Instagrams or their Twitter accounts. So that's not going into making Americans work better. It's going into uh, making Americans play better. The other, the, the other idea is that it's coming. It just hasn't gotten here yet. There you think about artificial intelligence, machines that can scan x-rays and radiograms. Uh, better than humans can. So that idea is that productivity is coming. It just hasn't happened right. yet. Just keep, be patient for it. You know, after the bell, Amazon announces taking over Ring again. You know, you talk about technology getting its tentacles, Jeffrey, into our very lives. They know everything about us and they watch us every minute of the day. So perhaps it is about leisure, but you would think with Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotics, big data collection, we'd be doing a lot better. I think it's two things. It's delayed. If you think about the 1990s, Alan Greenspan enjoyed the after effects of the personal computer boom, which started in the late 70s, early 80s. So it takes time to show up, as John said. And, you know, I think it, it's ahead of us still. So there's a lot of things that maybe we're not capturing correctly. Because in order to right. measure productivity, you need to measure output. Right. And, you know, in the 1990s, Charles, I had 300 CDs in a tower and now I have 30 million songs on the smartphone in my pocket you know and I paid for those CDs I'm paying nine dollars a month for a streaming service for music my life is much better are we capturing so that does that mean productivity is doomed data? I think it's it's set to boom in the years ahead I think that's uh, the message that I would it just and, and, and I, I should say that that will be great news for the American economy and for American workers and for American Absolutely. stocks if that if, if that happens that's really the key ingredient to increasing prosperity. Real, real quick then, John, let me ask you about unwinding the balance sheet, or as uh, Henseling said, the unbalanced balance sheet. Right. How are they mm -hmm. going to go about that? Uh, well, the Fed built up securities of $4.5 trillion, mortgage and treasury securities. How are they going to go about doing it? Very, <laughs> very 
very slowly. They're allowing these securities to mature without, uh, w without reinvesting in them. It's going to take years to get that balance sheet down in frack. Well, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near at, at the end of this process where it was when the financial crisis started. There'll be a new normal, right? It was around $800 new, billion The new or normal is going to be a couple trillion at, right. at least. Right. Jeffrey, real quick, uh, any chance that they can uh, make a mistake there? Because that's a big question mark. I think it's, it's overhyped, Charles. If you look at the balance sheet as a share of GDP, which is how I think you should look at it, it's about 22%. It's not much, you know, it's not very big. It's not a huge share of GDP. If you really want to pick on a central bank, I would look at the Bank of Japan, where the balance sheet is 95% of GDP. That, that's a much bigger concern, I think, in terms right. of its impact on the markets than the Federal Reserve. All so, right, gentlemen. It, Thank you both very much. I wish we had more time. We've been squeezed with a couple of breaking news stories. In fact, I've got a program alert now for the audience. You don't want to miss uh, tonight because uh, my, tomorrow night, rather, I'm going to have two big time financial experts, Bill Miller, Miller Value Partners, and Jeremy Siegel, the, fi the finance professor from Wharton, uh, both from the Forbes conference in Las Vegas, two titans in the industry. We'll be talking to the economy and stock investing then.